I must. Okay. Okay. Recording started. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, this talk. Well, you've heard me speak two or three times in this series before, and you'll notice that after I retired in nine in twenty twenty, I don't give talks on research. They're more musings on what I learnt over the fifty years before I retired. And this is possibly amusing on what I didn't learn to start with, but gradually picked up and only recently have sort of really under, not understood, really begun to think about. And it comes from the reason I got to it was Jim Smith was 70 this year. Um, and there was a seminar day for him and I was invited to speak. And anybody who's been in one of in a seminar in which Jim is in the audience will know that if you dare go near a subjective probability of any or a probability of any kind, a voice from the back will interrupt you with a scream of whose probability, who owns it, who made it up, who whose beliefs are you modeling, that sort of thing. And so it seemed a good title to take for a talk in in his honor. And it led me into exploring a bit more about what we're eliciting when we elicit probabilities and indeed utilities. So I'm not going to talk about those today um, and how they help shape the modeling that we do and eventually the communication. I shall spend rather less on the communication, but a lot more on the elicitation or what we are eliciting, not how we elicit. So. As I said, musing on my career and everything else, roll back the um, history to the beginning, October 1971. Um, I was starting my third year of a maths degree. I've been through my second year where I'd hated classical statistics. I didn't know what the hell I was gonna be doing in finals. Why the hell had I selected stats as one of my options? Um, but I was locked into it. Um, and I was assuming that I was going to turn over and, and really major on numerical analysis and computing. But anyway, I turned up at the first lectures and they were given by a guy called Adrian Smith, who many of you will know, and a guy called Mike Dempster, who many of you may or may not know. But they were completely sold on the Bayesian idea and they sold it to me hook, line and sinker. And over my career, I've seen it's been the Bayesian idea of subjective expected utilities used to structure many statistical analyses, many risk analyses, and many decision analyses. And it's a pretty simple idea. Um, this is not quite savage or the group, but you, you've seen it all. The Bayesian model says we have states of the world, we have possible actions, those actions interact with the states and lead us to some consequences. The problem owner looking at the world thinks about those consequences and has a probability distribution over the unknown state of the world and a utility function valuing the consequences. With luck, they can observe something. So the problem owner can observe X in some sample space or whatever X with probabilities that depend on the state of the world. They update those his her prior probability P theta from theta to p theta theta given x by Bayes' theorem. That's why we call it all Bayesian. They then choose the action that maximizes their expected posterior utility. And whoopee, we've done it all. And even better, if you follow people like that were writing back in the 70s, um, particularly people like Dennis Lindley, who, if any of you know the history of Bayesian stats in the UK, Dennis Lindley was the archbishop and one listened to his eulogies and his um, sermons with great attention, that all uncertainties should be modelled by probabilities and all preferences should be modelled by utility functions. And I learned that particularly well because he was my external examiner and I read him very carefully before I went into my viva and, and you know, all of that from my PhD. But anyway, that was what we got. And then gradually over the years after that, I began to find out people don't obey the axioms of rationality underpinning Bayesian SEU. Um, you have 
heuristics and biases, as they were called then by Kahneman and Tversky coming out in the 70s. Edwards had asked some questions like that about that late 50s. But, you know, Bayesians were not what real people were. Nowadays, instead of talking about heuristics and biases, you talk about unconscious or subconscious so system one thinking and conscious system two thinking. But the history of the last 50 years in psychology is showing that whether people want to be Bayesian or not, um, they certainly in practice are seldom Bayesian. And that led certainly around the 70s and 80s to big debates between normative and descriptive descriptive statistics. Normative was what you wanted to be, descriptive was what you were. Um, that was one problem in the background. The other was that an individual decision maker could be Bayesian, but if you tried to think about groups, um, sorry, if you try to think about groups, Arrow back in the 50s and many other people had shown lots of impossibility theorems that say essentially that the rationality, certainly of Bayesian rationality and concepts of fairness and democracy don't easily fit together. And if you fling in the possibility that people are dishonest, they horse trade, they enlarge the problem that they've, they're thinking about to include other problems and then offer to support somebody in another problem if that person will support them in this and you get strategic voting and and it's chaotic. Bayesian models don't quite fit with what you want. Um, I'm going to argue that there are ways of thinking about how an individual can learn but to actually think about how you solve a group problem you, you need to look at the process in which you apply Bayesian analysis or any other analysis for that matter, along with the analysis itself. And we'll get to that in a minute. What Bayesians went on to say, and a lot of other people have gone on to say, is you don't just distinguish between normative and descriptive. You start talking about prescriptive analysis, where you recognize people as subject to system one thinking, but you try to nudge them and help them towards system two thinking. You help to try and get rid of their biases and you, or heuristic ways of thinking. And Glenn Schaefer articulated that as argument by analogy. What he really says is, suppose a real person has a real shopping problem in a street, for instance, or a real person has a real problem about um, something rather more serious, but this guy's in a street, he wants to go shopping, maybe it's a birthday present, there's lots of shops to go to, he doesn't quite know what he wants, he doesn't know if what's in the windows are going to be what's inside the shops. There's uncertainty bounding around everywhere. And to try and help them, you start creating a model. And you model, first of all, the street and the shops. And this isn't a perfect representation it's got lots of assumptions built into it about structures um and and what might be in the window and how shops display their goods and so on and so forth and shopping in those shops would lead to some sort of consequent function and that is the model of the real world the consequence function says that if you take action a and the state of the world is theta, you get consequence C, and that's what you need to think about because in decision making, you want to get the best C in some sense of the word, expected utility. Um, so you've got a model of the world, they then create the model of the decision maker. Um, a fairly simplified model, obeying the axioms of rationality of Bayesian's theorem and Bay Bayesian stats and so on, um, Savage or whoever you like to follow. Um, and that model is actually simply a pro prior probability, an observational distribution, utility function. That model is the model decision maker. It's got rationality built into it, but it may also have other things built into it, which we'll get to in a minute. And by observing the behavior of this model decision maker in this model world, this guy, the real person, can think about the problem, maybe think through his choice better. You've got the analogy of what his choice is over here, and he's thinking about it by looking at behaviors in that analogy, that model. And 
it got slightly confused or it started out slightly confused because if you look at all the early writings on um, the axioms behind um, subjective expected utility, they tend to be thou and you. That So the axioms are stated are thou believe that things are transitive, you um, are not, you know, prefer A to B or whatever it is, but but they actually identify it in a way that makes you think that you're being modeled. And I sort of thought that was true all the way through to many a year, many a month ago, but not many a year ago. Um, and it's gradually become clear to me that we need to think about what this model decision maker, this person over here is modeling. Because to start with, you think about the idealizations here being purely the Bayesian axioms, and then subject to being constrained to fit those axioms, this model fits the real decision makers' beliefs and preferences. Well, that's not actually true, because you start building instructional assumptions saying that certain probabilities are independent out there, which he or she may agree with, it's it sort of constraining the model a bit first. And then you start thinking about, do I prefer A to B? And you'd start breaking that down into multiple criteria. And then as you do that, you start thinking about how do I balance these up? And you're led into all the axioms of multi-attribute utility and multi-attribute value. And so you get various probabilistic and preference independence beginning to structure your thoughts. And they may, be your real preferences because you're actually as various people like Paul Slovak has said not in an analysis measuring your preferences and beliefs you're constructing them and you're constructing them to fit with structural assumptions along with the rationality ones as we talk about in stats you may actually decide and risk analysis you may decide decide to bring in certain aspects of knowledge or equally to exclude them. Because if you want to be objective, many people being objective exclude certain um, beliefs they might personally hold. So you've got that happening. And so much of elicitation relates to identifying and agreeing the idealizations and structural assumptions built into the model and the model decision maker. And if we think about that, you can begin to think a bit more about the processes of designing the analysis, well, the dissertation and the analysis. And if we go to groups and you're not working with a single decision maker, but there are three shoppers here looking into a window, you've got the model of the street, but now you have three model shoppers. And what I do in analysis, or how I think of group decision analysis, is you don't you look at each of these with the whole group and each group can see how much this guy differs from that guy or that woman or whatever it is and they can begin to understand each other and so on and they come to a decision by looking at what they want looking at the group knowing all about all the other social pressures behind any horse trading that's going on how altruistic they feel towards other people's preferences and so on and intuitively they, they come to a consensus. I'm not saying that the Bayesian model guarantees that consensus is rational, but what it does is it helps the deliberation and discussion as you get there. So groups observe a family of model decision makers to see each other's points of view is what, what goes on to my mind. Okay, so if we come back to this model, Jim's question becomes, whose probability there? Whose probability there? Whose probability there? And should they or can all the uncertainties be modeled by probabilities? And I would also say whose utility, but I'm not going to go into that talk at the moment. Okay. So where do we get those? Who's being modeled? And there's a lot of possibilities. You've got the obvious problem owner who may be a scientist if you're doing stats, a risk manager if you're doing risk analysis, or a decision maker or decision makers if you're supporting decision and doing decision analysis. You may actually ask experts. And if, if I'm blunt, this group goes out and asks experts a lot more for their opinion than they ask the problem maker owner. Oh, no. 
So we need to think a bit about that. They might ask stakeholders. Some of us do that. You go and look at stakeholders to find out what they are thinking about the problem because the problem owner might want to either be altruistically kind to the stakeholder and do what they want, or at least take into account what they want in her decision making. Funnily enough, the analyst often chucks in some assumptions. Um, and the analyst builds into the model some of his or her beliefs. And, and that might be relevant. And then if we're talking about science or major risk things, there's a peer review community out there. Regulators, science journals, whatever. And they're sort of looking at it and they, some of their beliefs might want to go in there in some way or be involved. And the public, um, through audit or because they need to trust the process, you know, if, if you're listening to, um, well, were listening to some of the medics talking about COVID and how you should behave and everything else and doing an analysis on your health and so on, the, everybody needs to think about the public trust and how what the public believe and so on, which may be relevant, may not be. So there's lots of possibility for the who in the who's. And let's talk a bit about uncertainty. So I've done this, I think, in a previous talk last year, or was it earlier this year? Um, typically, there are rather more uncertainties than we care to acknowledge in problems. Um, there's the classic ones that uh, relate to our knowledge of the external world, stochastic um, ones, actor ones, where you don't know what the behaviours of others are. And that can just be looked at on the stochastic, but I tend to think it's helpful to separate that out as it's not purely random what other people do. And epistemic, um, which is your lack of knowledge. And in fact, a good few Bayesians have called all of these epi epistemic because you're, you certainly lack the knowledge of what the random outcome will be or what somebody else will do, perhaps. So your knowledge of the external world is one type of uncertainty. There's whole lots of ways of talking about that. Then you're going to do an analysis and that draws or builds in uncertainties because you have to make decisions about what to include in models and what not to. Um, you have to make decisions about computational things like how you're going to do the analysis. And once it's going, you, you get uncertainties because any computer doesn't make perfect calculations are damn good but they're, they're not perfect and what's worse is when a human's controlling a problem there's often mistakes built into the program so you get those errors coming through um, nowadays you get errors because um, machine learning and artificial intelligence has been trained on an unrepresentative training set or whatever so you've got lots of little errors coming in that way and at the end, even if you could do perfect modeling, inverted commas, you could do all your, sorry, perfect calculation. Even if you could go from your model through to a result without any question, it was accurate and perfect. You would still have the problem that the model isn't the world. And when you take, think about the distance of the numbers that your model's predicting for measurements or profits or whatever, and what you get in the real world, there's going to be a modeling error. So all of those are modeling and analysis errors. And then around it in almost all problems, before you really get into any numbers, you find out when you work with people, their thinking has got lack of clarity in there. They can be ambiguous about what they mean by certain things. That may be because they're not clear themselves about themselves. Or worse still, many of our um, risk analyses or decision analyses, someone up there government um, board of a company or whatever has decreed this company will maximize safety and doesn't actually define what safety is or we want to reduce the risk of a dangerous impact to such and such but doesn't actually define what a dangerous impact is and so you have to deal with the uncertainty about what is it you're exactly looking at what do you want to look at what how should your consequences be measured? Um, you also may be uncertain about your values. A lot of people don't know quite what they want. Um, and put on top of that, there may be ethical questions. 
what is the ethical question about a mistake that's been made because you used a wrong training set for AI? You know, how do you think that one through? Um, and at the end of the day, you've got this question that Larry Phillips talks about a lot. Um, have you done enough analysis to make a decision or to hand over to the risk manager or whatever it is? Has the scientist done enough analysis to publish a paper? Those sorts of things. So we've got scientific uncertainties, which we all talk about and work with. We've got modeling and analysis uncertainties, which are usually ignored, and I'm going to ignore them pretty much. We're not quite for the rest of the day, but but I'm not going to deal with it as much as I want to. That may be another. No, I didn't say that, Tina. That's not another tool for next term. <laughs> term after. Um, and the last one is there are things there that we're not quite sure of that relate to how we want to evaluate the different consequences, what we want to measure, what we want to look at, and so on. And I think they need to be resolved by deliberation. Okay? But they've all got to be elicited, not just quantitatively. We've got to elicit much more of the meanings and understandings of the world that already lie behind those. And many, when it comes down to uncertainties, are not amenable to probability modelling, nor investigating through qualitative or sensitivity analysis. If you look at what Larry Phillips talks about being requisite, you can't measure that. It's not a probability. It's an internal judgment because it relates to crossing back from your model world to the real world. And whatever that is, it's a mind body problem. Roger can lecture us on the sort of philosophy behind it somewhere along the line. Okay. So, elicitation. I see that as starting off with two types. Well, having a long gradation between. One extreme where you're doing soft elicit elicitation is all about qualitative understandings that you try to identify the entities in a situation, cause and effects that you're prepared to accept and expect to be going on, your stochastic and scientific uncertainties and your values and preferences. You build a model and that model is going to have parameters in it. And those parameters might be physical ones, which you have to elicit as numbers, probabilities, utilities. And the ones we always forget, computational parameters, how far, if you're doing Monte Carlo, how big is your sample? If you're doing Monte Carlo, how far along do you want to go before it settles down and you say it's converged enough? All those sorts of parameters get built into, or even if you're not doing um, simulation type things, if you're doing a pure calculations, technically doing it well, you're still going to be implicitly setting parameters to tell the computer not to keep on calculating a Bessel function to the 49th decimal place or whatever it would be. So there's lots of parameters that have got to be assessed to fit the models that also have to be assessed. And that's a sort of continuous process because parameters only have meaning in their model. So choose a different model and you have to perhaps think your parameters are going to be different. And I would say also that if at the end of the analysis, we're going to have to communicate and we're going to have to be communicate in the world that's been eliciting here. So elicitation sets the context for all future communications. Um, and we'll come back to that a bit more as we go along. So back to the question, who's probability? Well, let's start with statistics. This is pure stats where I'm talking about a scientist not driven by a need to make a profit or anything else. You sat in his lab or her lab doing some research, getting some data and so on. And they want to see what's going on in the world. We're getting towards confirmatory statistics where you're going to get modeling coming up. And, and God help me, in the old language, significance levels and those sort of things. So Bayesians wouldn't go there. And we can start getting posterior probabilities. So to start with, you've got to actually formulate the model of the world that you're trying to test, validate, whatever you want to say. And you're going to do that. And you might well do it by talking with the problem owner, the scientist, 
But you might also want to draw in either by talking to the scientist or by reading the literature or working with a group of experts, other scientists that is, you might want to find out what the consensus view is, which could be different from this scientist who may have a hobby horse theory. Um, so you might want to start looking at the world through the scientist's eyes or scientific consensus eyes. And then having done that, when you want a prior to put in there, a prior probability, you can go to the scientist. You could go to this scientific consensus. You could try and drag it out of that by working groups of experts, or maybe there are published things in the literature and so on. But typically what also happens is in much of science and certainly in objective Bayesian statistics, which is a group that I don't 100% subscribe to, you try and define a completely ignorant scientist so that if the data, if, sorry, if the prior represents complete ignorance on the part of the scientist, anything that you get out the end will be given to you by the data. So you're letting the data speak for themselves, as the saying goes. So you might have a prior which is informative, which has a hobby horse. You might have a prior which captures scientific consensus, which might not be quite the same. Or you might try and be completely ignorant. And then to cap it all, having written down what your prior is and, and elicited it and so on, the analyst might come along and say, well, don't like that. I want a conjugate prior or I want a prior that has this behavior because it'll make the computation easier. So you might pervert whatever prior you take to make the computation easier. The simplest way of thinking about that is Many times, if you use a flat prior, prior things become ill-balanced. So you don't use a flat prior to measure complete ignorance. You use something with a slight hump in the middle, not a lot, and a huge range, but still a, a, a finite range in some sense. Um, and that will get you convergence in ways that a completely flat one wouldn't. And analysts often do that, and then they let the range get bigger and bigger and try and see where it goes. When you come to the observational distribution, it's exactly the same, except it's normally not complete ignorance. So the scientists might put it in. You might look at the scientific consensus. What do everybody agree the measuring instruments behave like? Or you might then bring in some adjustment from the analysts to get convergence or whatever in the calculation. You do your calculations, you get a posterior, and at that point, you can fairly claim that that's the thing that should be judged by the scientist who's conducting the experiment. Is it giving me enough information, enough understanding that I've got a new discovery or a new thing and I can go out and publish it? And if you do that, at that point, you end up doing peer review and replication on it. And if it all works through, you end up with scientific consensus. And I would say this replication might involve several different priors by different scientists repeating the experiment and so on to see and build it into scientific consensus. So you've got all that going on. And then at the end of it, you remember, well, we didn't actually put in all the um, things about judging how to do the experiment, what equipment to use what modeling techniques to use what computational techniques to use whether or not at the end of it we were really requisite and those things mean that the problem owner the analyst and the peer community after you've got through the replication bit have to own those uncertainties and be aware of them and often they're not and furthermore if you look at what's called the replication crisis at the moment you can start asking questions like, have people doing the replication done the analyses purely assuming that all the data and all the analysis done previously included all uncertainties and were done perfectly accurately and were judged perfectly and the uncertainties in those things were judged? Um, the judgmental uncertainties were, were fine, 
or have they just ignored those? And in fact, some of the replication clashes we're seeing where people don't get the same result are due not to poor science, but to poor communications and reporting of unmodeled uncertainties. OK, let's get back to the shopping street. We go back there. We're beginning to see that from that previous list of different people, the decision maker, this guy, may be an amalgam of several different real or even we see hypothetical, well, hypothetical people, a completely ignorant scientist is hypothetical. So this guy may be that comes from scientific, cons sorry, that comes from a hypothetically ignorant scientist, that comes from um, scientific consensus, that might be a loss function that represents something or utility function representing something to do with society, but I'm not going into utility. But whatever it is, you're getting an amalgam used and a different amalgam possibly for each one of these quantities. So elicit part of elicitation be dis or it should be deciding on who's included in that amalgam and where they're included. And I sometimes doubt if we ever do that. Well, not sometimes doubt. I certainly doubt that I ever did. Um, and my guess is several of you haven't. Um, you've just gone in there with the assumption that you take this, elicit this probability, this probability, and so on. And then you um, turn the handle on Bayes' theorem and possibly subjective utility. If we go off into risk analysis rather than statistical analysis, the same table, what do we say there? Well, a scientist may put in their own prior probability, or that, but sorry, a scientist may put in their own models there. But in risk analysis, you almost always work with scientific consensus um, because, first of all, the risk owner and the risk managers don't actually have a real model. They haven't done any investigations themselves. They're just taking science off the shelf. And secondly, they don't want to put in much of their own preferences and preference, sorry, prejudices or beliefs. They want to avoid putting in anything of their own because if it all goes pear shaped and the risk comes to pass, they don't want to be blamed for it. So you don't get the personal bits going in there. You might start bringing in some stakeholder beliefs now, particularly if you've got a problem with many scenarios and whatever going on. And I'm not going to go off into that detail either. But you might get um, stakeholder beliefs coming in because in a risk analysis, it might be wise to do one also for what the stakeholders believe, either because it will show that what you're doing is pretty good or it will identify why they're disagreeing with you so violently. Um, so you might have that coming. The prior, pretty much always scientific consensus. And maybe the analyst comes along because they've got to do the calculations. They come and simplify the calculations or the, what we, you know, that sort of thing comes in again. If there's any observation, scientific consensus may be modified for computation. At the end of the day, though, the posterior distribution or the distributions you're using of the potential risks are the have to be owned by the problem owner, the risk manager, because they're going to have to take decisions on risk mitigation and so on. And the unmodeled residual uncertainties, certainly a problem owner risk manager needs to be there, but also the analyst needs to own up to any uncertainties they brought in, their judgmental uncertainties. And usually in big risk analyses, you're running around with a peer community and a regulator looking over your shoulder and checking if they agree with what you've done. So they also have to understand the unmodeled uncertainties as well as why they got to this answer through the other things. If we do the same table for decision analysis, it gets slightly more complicated. I'm going to go quickly because I'm beginning. I think I've made my point or hope I have and time is going. I want discussion. But you can have individual decision makers and I've never done one for that. Any decision analyst listening, when we get to discussion, do tell me if you've done one for a real decision maker, a single person. 
because it's always a group when I've done it. Um, and that group may be an organization which makes life easier because the organization is usually formed by people of like mind and has a mission and some clear objectives and so on. If it's a commercial company, it will have shareholder and, um, objectives. You know, it's, it's all laid down profit maximization and a few other odds and ends. But generally, the organization is that all the values involved are correlated and all the probabilities are correlated. It's much more straightforward. Then you can get group decision making where people are drawn from various other places and may not agree with each other at all. You may have major problems getting them together. And finally, you've got at the top society. Now, let me do the first three very quickly, because what I want to make the point is, again, if you go through for an individual, actually, you get the same ones pretty much every time until you get to the posterior where the decision maker has to take ownership. But that's different to what you get with an organization because an organization got a management team board. You've got organizations, missions, which may be written down in some sort of governance. You've got experts and stakeholders coming into it, or even shareholders. We go through that again and you get slightly different people involved all the way along. Um, and if we did groups, again, things go along and you get different people involved. You might, when you get to the posterior, actually attribute it to a hypothetical super decision maker in the sense of some altruistic being that's looking down on the group and trying to make a judgment that fits. So it is a best balance between all the groups, individual, all the individuals, preferences and utilities and um, probabilities and so on. And again, you've got a modeled residual uncertainties which have to be looked at and owned by all of those people so what i wanted to make the point uh, damn it, sorry too many clicks those three groups if i go back if you go through each one is different so coming back to my question whose probability, it really depends on the context. The fact that the patterns are different between statistical analysis, risk analysis, and decision analysis might explain in part why some people sort of are full-time statistical analysts, some people are full-time risk analysts, and some people are full-time decision analysts because they're all doing slightly different things and working to different priorities and different different people but even if it's not when you come to do an elicitation you ought to be asking what's the context and who do i want to include in the amalgam because it may be different in different contexts and you ought to check out what you're doing and not just do it every time if you see what i mean and finally this last one political processes this comes from a paper that Nikos Agrarius and I did way back in before 2020. I think it was about 2018. Um, it got published in the decision analysis. You have a situation in most politics where you have lots of analyses feeding into the final discussions. You have analyses that, if you like, are purely scientific, looking at what's happening out there in the world. Um, and how the world is changing, and they may have different data sets. They may use different styles of analysis, some Bayesian and some non-Bayesian. Um, these data sets may analyze, overlap and may not overlap. A lot of these statistical analyses will not be done by people who are entirely brilliant at statistics, but they still believe the results. They've taken some, um, well, now people are actually advertising GPT-4, driven statistical analyses package where you can throw the data at the package and it will give you the answer without ever asking or bothering to ask you what the question was almost um so you you've got lots of things coming in here of various different provenances various different things overlapping not overlapping making similar assumptions making conflicting assumptions on preference sides of things 
you have different stakeholder groups may be doing decision analysis, may not actually be doing any decision analysis, but writing reports, saying what they want. And here you have this Tower of Babel or Land of Babel, where some political process is trying to draw it all together. At the moment, 143, somewhere in Parliament, I think you will find our Prime Minister is trying to keep his own party together because they're arguing about whether or not we can deport or we can send illegal immigrants to, to Rwanda while we judge whether or not we're going to let them into the country. There's so many arguments going on. Whatever that political process is, ain't going to be rational. It ain't going to be Bayesian. Um, more important, if you think back to COVID, in the UK at least, and I'm pretty sure in most countries, during the COVID crisis, you had the government doing discussions on this and this, and maybe having two or three groups, different committees, doing different analyses. But you also had other people not related to the government doing analyses and sending them through. You had a complete Tower of Babel, which was confusing to the public and various other people. Anyway, I shall leave it there, um, except saying that if, this, if you're involved in this, we need much more help in communicating informatively between all these groups so that you can see what the essence of all of them is saying, if there is a consistent essence. And you need to identify those during elicitation. So you really understand the assumptions, bring them out and communicate them. And I shall shut up now with a few conclusions. If you don't understand the question, you are you are unlikely to be able to answer it, which is why I always start off with soft elicitation and I get worried when I see people go into a consultancy and take the question that they're given without really pushing it through. Now, I'm not suggesting many people do that, but I know some do. Um, elicitation defines those questions in the soft bit, and then it builds a model decision maker in a model world. And the, the model decision maker is the person whose judgments are constructed, but they may be an amalgam of many individuals, some hypothetical, um, elicitation includes deciding on who's included in the amalgam and which individuals are selected to differentiate Bayesian statistics, sorry, which individuals are selected tends to differentiate statistics, risk and decision analyses. So let me leave it there. There were a few papers. That one is basically this paper with the utility in it and it's it was accepted on Sunday, he said. So it's definitely, it's, you can certainly have the draft. It's going to be published in the decision analysis and there's going to be a comment on it with a rejoinder from me. Okay. Um, but I'll leave that as it is. Okay. Thank you.